sermons are in a constant state of evolution. And as the sermon for today evolved, uh, I changed the text, uh, although the text that is on the screen, I think it's going to be on the screen, is, um, is appropriate as well from Philippians uh, chapter 4, verse 4. But I'll reveal the text in just a moment. How great it is to be here. So many memories. So many wonderful, wonderful memories. Of course, most of the friends that I had when I was here uh, 50 years ago were out in the cemetery now. But there are still a few uh, who are sprinkled around that I've been able to greet and hopefully a few more. And if I do not remember you, uh, it's because not only I have changed, but you have changed as well. But there are people that I do remember well, and uh, we'll uh, look forward to seeing them in a little while. I want to welcome my brother Jay from Pascagoula, and his wife Becky, and uh, my wonderful niece uh, Sydney and uh, good to have them with us. I invited them to stay for lunch because I knew uh, Colville folks, even though you're not the same folks as 50 years ago, I knew you would have an abundance of food. Father, let the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Can everybody hear? Yes. Everybody's good. Okay. We didn't have a fancy sound system when I was here. Uh, of course, I had more breath uh, back then than I do now uh, as well and could holler a little bit louder. Some years ago, we were on a tour of Italy. We love Italy. We love the culture in Italy. We love the history in Italy. We love the architecture in Italy. Uh, we love the food in Italy. Uh, we love all the churches in Italy. Uh, we love the cathedrals and the basilicas in Italy. Did I mention we love the food in Italy? Uh, Italy is a wonderful place if you ever have the opportunity. Yes, thank you for saying amen. Uh, Italy is a wonderful place to visit if you ever have the opportunity to go there. Now, in Italy, there is a church on every corner, it seems like. Sometimes there are two on the same corner. And uh, some of these are called chapels, and some are called churches. Some are called cathedrals, and some, like St. Peter's, uh, where the uh, Pope is the bishop, is, uh, the, the, is a basilica. And you don't know unless they tell you which is a cathedral and which is a basilica. Both are homes to a bishop. A bishop is a cathedral, like the cathedral here in Biloxi is where the bishop of the area uh, presides. So we were walking through Italy and uh, seeing all these churches on our tour. And here was a cathedral, and here was a basilica, and here was a cathedral, and here was a basilica, and we knew that, that a bishop was there. Someone in the group said to our tour guide, can you tell me the difference between a basilica and a cathedral? And he said, of course I can. He said, a basilica is a church where a bishop resides, but also it is a church that has an ancient relic, such as uh, St. Mark's in Venice has the bones of uh, St. Mark. Uh, St. Peter in Rome is where St. Peter is buried down beneath. St. Peter in Change is a basilica that has the chains that Peter was brought uh, to Rome in. And so my wife uh, said, our church back in Colorado has an ancient relic and uh, the tour guide looked and said, you're Methodist, I know that. Uh, tell me what ancient relic you have in your church. And she looked at him and she said, my husband. <laughs> True story. Um, it is ancient time for many of us. Uh, I calculated some of the times I've been back after my ministry from 1967 to 1971 here uh, when the sanctuary was built and this beautiful church. Um, 
and um, as I look back uh, those 54 years now I guess uh, I remember so many things and I want to share some of those things with you uh, this morning but uh, we've moved around of course as we have left here uh, in 1971 and I came back in 1983 to preach I came back in 2000 uh, and preached and uh, now it's 2021 I figure that I preach here an average of once every 19 years which means I'll see you again when I'm 98. <laughs> Someone asked me what my early morning ritual was. What are the things you do when you first get up in the morning? And I explained that as I got up in the morning, Diane makes the bed and begins brewing the coffee, I make my way to my study uh, in the home. And on my way to the study at home, I quote my favorite uh, Bible verse. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We might say, let us be happy in it. Because I'm determined that I want to be happy on a particular day when I get up. I rejoice that I am up and about and able to get up and move around and take nourishment and still be somewhat uh, productive. And I rejoice also that I can be glad or happy in this particular day which God has given us. Let us rejoice and be happy in it. I'm determined I will not be a grumpy old man. I never want to be a grumpy old man. I've known enough of them, and women as well, in my lifetime to know how I do not want to age. I want to be happy. I want people to want to be around me. I'm happy because I'm a Methodist. My daughter asked me when she was 14 years old. She's in her 40s now. She's a psychologist in Franklin, Tennessee. But... Uh, uh, she asked me when she was 14 and the boys were beginning to come around, you know, and uh, she wasn't dating yet, but we were at St. Luke's Church in Jackson at the time, and we were on our way uh, to get ice cream after church one Sunday evening. As we made our way to Baskin Robbins, uh, there was a particular little Baptist boy who had been there that evening. Uh, he had been calling, he had been seeing her at the mall, and he had been uh, hanging around with her uh, more than Daddy wanted her to. And so uh, she was thinking what 14-year-olds think, what if I grow up and this is the one for me? And so she asked me, she said, Daddy, if you weren't a Methodist, what would you be? And I said, honey, I'd be ashamed. <laughs> I'm happy to be a Methodist. The Methodist Church has more hospitals, more homes for the elderly, more colleges, more schools, more daycare centers, more universities, more seminaries than any other Protestant denomination in America. The Methodist Church feeds a million kids around the world every day through UMC Award. The Methodist Church is the second largest group of Christians in any section of the United States. In the West, it's Catholic. In the Northeast, it's Catholic. Uh, the largest in the Midwest is Lutheran. But we're the second in every area of the United States. We are a universal church around the world in over 100 countries. You have great reason to be proud that you're a Methodist. But I want to bring it close back home. I want to share with you one particular reason why I am so happy that I'm a Methodist. It was the time around Katrina. Some of you remember Katrina in 2005. The Sunday after Katrina hit, I'd finally been able to make contact with my brother in Pascagoula. I knew the Pascagoula area and the Iberville, all areas around here, had been devastated by that catastrophic storm. I told Jay I was going to come down and, and bring what I could in my pickup on the Monday after Sunday. And uh, we, rendez we made a place to rendezvous. And he told me what to bring, you know, bring... Uh, toilet paper of course and water and gasoline uh, canned goods and 
all the things that we could, that we needed. He told me all that they needed. And so I resolved that I would go down. Sunday morning I announced in worship at First Methodist Batesville where I was serving now, a great, great church. And there were about 400 in worship that morning. And uh, uh, I made the announcement that the next day I would be going down to the coast to take supplies, what I could put in the back of my pickup truck. And uh, one of my secretaries in the church said, I I'll go with you and help. And one of the firemen in the community said, I'm off tomorrow, I'll go and help. So I had three to go and help. Mr. Henry Hefner is a great Christian and member of that church. He owns three automobile uh, dealerships in Batesville. And uh, he stood up. He has a distinctive way of talking. A preacher. That little old import truck you drive ain't big enough to take much to the coast. I got a big old pickup out on my lot. You have. It's one of them dooley kind of pickups. and got a bigger bed than what you got. And I challenge other folks to bring stuff this afternoon and let's load my pickup up for the preacher and the fireman and the secretary to take to the coast. And so he brought this big old pickup, uh, biggest pickup I've ever seen or been in, and parked it in the church parking lot. And not only that, every five-gallon container of gasoline that he could find around his three dealerships was already in the back of it. Other people brought ice chests filled with ice. Other people brought uh, toilet paper and staples and enough spam to feed Steve Taylor's uh, hunting camp for a, a month. And uh, we filled that pickup up. And uh, we made our way down. We left at 6 o'clock that morning from Batesville, five-hour drive. We got to uh, Escataba about 11 or 11.30. And... Uh, the National Guard met us. They said, you can't go farther than here. And I said, I've got to. This is from Batesville, Mississippi. And we've got all this stuff in the back. And we, we're not going to spend the night. Don't worry. We're not looters. We're Methodist people. And we just want to deliver this for the use of the people here on the coast. So finally, he called his general or his colonel or something. And they let us through just to take the stuff and then get back out of there. And so we made our way down. It took us about an hour to get from Escataba uh, down to toward the beach. I went down Market Street and I turned on Washington Avenue where my mama's condominium was on the other end of Washington. When I turned off a of market to the left, here was this van. And on the side of that van was a sign that made me as proud to be a Methodist as I've ever been. Disaster Relief North Carolina Annual Conference the United Methodist Church with the cross and flame by it. That, those folks from North Carolina got to the coast quicker than that preacher from Batesville and fed my mama a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And forever I will be proud to be a Methodist because of that. If I wasn't a Methodist, I'd be ashamed. I'm proud not just, just to be a Methodist, but I'm happy also to be a preacher. Now, Barbara Jones? Barbara Jones. This is the reason I'm saying that sermons evolve. Uh, met me coming in, and she didn't think I remembered her, but I do. I remember her from Ocean Springs. And uh, she said, you know, your first Sunday in Ocean Springs was my first Sunday to visit the church there. And I was a member of another denomination. And she said, on your first Sunday, you said, from here on, we're forward. We're going to move forward. And uh, she said, that was the beginning of my 40-year journey as a United Methodist. Comments like that from 40 years ago make me happy to be a Methodist and happy to be a preacher. My grandson asked me a while back, he said, what do preachers do? He's 15 now. He was about 12 or 13. Very smart kid, of course. I'll show you pictures after the service. In um, but he asked me, what do preachers do, Papa? And I said, well, I, 
I said, preachers are custodians of the highest and holiest moments of people's lives. I said, for instance, one of the highest and holiest moments of my life was when your mama was baptized and I helped her in my arms along with Bishop Clay Lee, then Reverend Clay Lee, our district superintendent, and baptized her. And then in Batesville Church, when you were just a baby, when I took you in my arms along with five other preachers and we laid hands on you and baptized you. But not only that, Methodists are part of the lives of young people when they get married. How many weddings I performed right here in this church at this altar in my four years. In 1968, shortly after the church had been consecrated, the second wedding that I conducted here in this church, I was, it was during the rehearsal, and I was standing right here, and um, the bridesmaids started coming down, and the third one came down, maid of honor, sister of the bride, another one. That third one that came down was the prettiest, cutest, most beautiful woman I ever saw in my life. I met her right here. And I said, that's the woman I want to marry. But then I discovered she was only 18 at the time. And I was 27. And, you know, it wouldn't have fit well with many people around the congregation here if I was dating a teenager. And especially a teenager from Gulfport with plenty of teenagers here at the time if I wanted to date a teenager. But I wasn't going to do that. But when I turned 20, I put the rush on. I started going by where she worked once a week, checking in on her. You doing okay? She said, I began to think I had a terminal illness that he knew about that I didn't. And uh, finally I got up enough courage to ask her out. And that took me about three months to get her to go out with that old preacher. And we dated two weeks, and we got engaged. And two months later, we got married right here at the altar of this church. 51 years ago. But then I remember, I told my grandson, I remember funerals. Highest and holiest moments of lives, remember? I remember so many funerals here. You know that old Rough and Ready, that church that's somewhere around, we've seen pictures of it around, one on the worship cover. Um, that old church that used to sit here, they had a funeral one day and they had a big debate going in the church about whether to build a new one or not. And uh, there were some that didn't want to and some that did. And one day they had a funeral here and as they were rolling the casket down the aisle, the floor collapsed, and the casket almost went through the floor. Now, you don't, you, you don't hear that story too much, but it happened. And um, they decided then to build a new church. And it was time. The termites had gotten that one. But so many funerals that I've connected, conducted, and I went on to tell him a couple that I had conducted. I remember one time when I came in one night after a meeting, and it had been a busy day. It was during the building program. I stayed busy helping see him and others around and doing what a preacher could. I couldn't do a carpenter's work, but I could be an encourager. And um, so uh, I went home and I started to go to bed, but I said, you know, that old gentleman in the hospital that had a heart attack, I told him yesterday, I'll see you tomorrow. I better go. And so I dressed and went to Biloxi Hospital, made my way in there about 9.30, made my way to his room. His daughter was with him. I walked in the door of the hospital room, and his eyes brightened and his face, face lit up, and he said to her, I told you my preacher would be here. The next morning, 8.30, his daughter called, Daddy just died. 
leadership of the Holy Spirit land. So I said, son, grandson, we're here for the highest and holiest moments of lives, births and baptisms, weddings and funerals. And my grandson says, oh, I got it. Hatch, match, and dispatch. <laughs> I'm happy to be a Methodist. I'm happy to be a preacher. And I'm happy I'm here. Amen. I know we have an order of the day in seven minutes. I've got about 15 minutes in my mind up here. And I'm an 18-minute preacher. always have been, even when I was here. And I know I'm past time. But since I won't be back until I'm 98 years old, Go ahead. Uh, and you're not going anywhere, and you haven't shook your watches at me yet, I'm just going to I'll say a word or two about why I'm glad I'm here. 1967, 57 years ago, whatever, 54 years ago, I pulled up in front of the old parsonage over here in my 67 Cutlass, which my daddy had signed the note on because I didn't have any credit and enough money to buy a car. And uh, he had given me the coupon book to pay off the $67 a month it took uh, to, to buy that car and uh, wished me well. I pulled up in the driveway and a couple minutes later, I don't know how he knew I was here, Rembert Speed pulled up. Many of you don't remember Rembert Speed, but he was a great, great, great guy. What an encourager Mr. Speed was. And we visited a minute, and he helped me unload a couple boxes and a stereo set and a frying pan and a coffee pot. And he said, now, how much do I owe you for moving expenses? And I told him, Rembert, I don't need any moving expenses. I just drove over this morning from my mom and daddy's house. and You don't need to pay me for the gas it took to get here. And when we moved back from Colorado, that move cost me 8700 bucks. <laughs> That's what it means to have a wife. <laughs> and 50 years of memories. See you in Plummer. Sitting right here. See, and I, see him and I butted hand, heads all the time. Especially during the building program. But one thing I never disputed was see him love this church and see him loved his mama. Ms. Nancy Plummer, whose Sunday school room was the first one on the left going into the educational building. I love your windows here. I'm glad you changed your windows some years back. I don't know when, when it was, but I know they're different. There's a story about those windows. We were getting close to the, having the uh, building finished and uh, CM said, Preacher, are you doing anything today? And I said, no. He said, well, take this pickup truck here and uh, I want you to go to New Orleans. And he said, I found some glass over there and I want you to go pick it up for me. They'll have it ready. And I said, CM, are you picking the glass out? Oh yeah, he said it's it's pretty glass. I, I they sent me a picture of it, and I think I think I think the people will like it. And I said, well, if you say so. And so I went over to New Orleans and uh, picked up the glass. And I had a question mark about it. And we brought it back and see him put it in the windows. The last week or two, we were putting the building together and finishing up. The Sunday after that. CM and I both learned a hard lesson. Let women pick out the color. Men know two colors, black and white, or maroon, or red, but they don't know mauve or chartreuse or uh, some of the other colors you ladies know. The colors in that glass that we picked out was hideous. And the women in the church were livid. <laughs> but we didn't have enough money to change it out. Thank you for changing the windows out. <laughs> Mr. Felsher, 
I don't know if it's recorded in the history or not, but uh, this cross back here was built from the beams of the old church that fell apart. And uh, Mr. Felsher built that the last week before we had service in here. Proudly, Mr. Felsher hung that cross. Maisie Stewart. I just had to bring her in there because uh, you can tell I like to eat. She made the best, best gumbo in Wool Market. Some would, discuss, some would, uh, some would disagree with that, but uh, I always felt she had the best. Odile Holly. If you didn't know Odile, you missed a treat. When I moved in, the old parsonage over here, it had a washing machine, didn't have a dryer, had a clothesline out back, and so I uh, made an effort to wash shirts. First week or two I was here, I had never washed a shirt before. I put them in the washer, put some soap in there, washed them, and then I tried to hang them out. And when I went outside, I hung about a tail of the shirt. I didn't know any different. Odile rode by in her car and she stopped and informed me in her not so gracious way that that was not the way to hang a shirt. And she showed me how to hang a shirt. Now Odile got up early in the morning. I loved Odile. She often was my lunchtime uh, host and called me and said, Preacher, you know, I've got lunch for come down and have lunch with us. But uh, that morning, one morning, she called me at 6 o'clock in the morning. Now, I was just out of seminary, out of graduate school, and I was used to staying up late studying, and I didn't get up at 6 o'clock. Remember, I was 25 then. I wasn't old like I am now. I get up about 5 now. But she, Odile, she had a, a way of talking that was distinct. And I'd say, hello. She'd say, you up? And uh, said, no, but I am now. And she'd give me the latest news from the telephone committee that circulated around between 5 and 6 in Wool Market. And uh, so I decided her, I would break her of this habit. I wouldn't do this now at the age of 79, but at the age of 25, I was willing to do it. So one night about 11.30, I rang Odile's telephone. Hello, she says. I said, you up? <laughs> Never again did Odile call me at 6 o'clock in the morning. Ophelia Curry. If there ever was a saint, it was Ophelia. Many times on a Sunday afternoon, about the time I'd finished my Sunday afternoon preacher nap, Odile, right across the street over here, would call and say, I've just finished your cake. Come over and have a piece. Best coconut cake I've ever eaten in my life. Joy says she has a recipe. She's found it, but she hadn't made me one yet. I'd like to have that cake, a wonderful cake. And on and on and on I could go. In an endless line of splendor, those people who have made this church the church it is, following Jesus and Barbara moving forward, always looking to Christ. Someone asked me a while back if I had a favorite poem. I have several favorites. But the poem I've asked to be read at my funeral is a poem I heard one Sunday night after worship sitting in the living room of the old parsonage over here. Jim Metcalf was a commentator in those years uh, with WWL-TV. And he would close the 10 o'clock news about 10.25 with commentary and a poem. Now, he never went down in history like Keats and Tennyson and Browning and the rest of the great poets. But this poem moved me, and I bought his book. Given the fact that I may not be here at age 98 when I'm invited back to preach, I want to share this poem in closing. 
and I share it because of my dreams that began here. Jim had just been diagnosed with cancer. He had only a couple months to live. This was his last time to be a commentator on WWL-TV. His last time to speak to the many audience, many, probably thousands, that listen to him every Sunday night. Now I will be going back. Back to where my dreams began. The day I turned, looked back, and said goodbye, and walked down the path that led to here and now, I thought I'd taken dreams enough to last a hundred lifetimes. But now I find that they're gone, and I don't know where they went. How many died? How many spent? How many realized? I think I must have left a few behind, a few I overlooked. Perhaps they may be there still, somewhere in that quiet, untroubled place, as bright and shiny new as they were when I first dreamed them. So I'll go back and look and hope. Hope I find just one to hold and keep alive in the brief and fleeting time that I have left for dreaming. And all the people said, Amen. Thank you, Ann. By the way, my knees have...